I just want to start off by uh, giving a warm round of applause to the wonderful staff in the dean's office for putting on uh, this type of event, because without their support, uh, this could uh, not happen. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Benedict, uh, Shannon, Robin, Andy, Randy, Matt, Regina, Wes, uh, Lizzie, Victoria, and Rasan. So let's just give them a round of applause. There they are. Yay. So uh, as you know, for us, uh, we really strongly believe that life is interconnected and a lot of the research discoveries that we do in the School of Biological Sciences are to ensure that not only that we uh, live longer, but that we live better. And so one of our foundational themes in BioSci are these three words, mind, body, world. And the idea behind, there, behind this concept is that for us to have a healthy mind, we need to have a healthy body. To have a healthy body, we need to have a healthy world. And it nicely encapsulates a lot of the research that's being done uh, in the School of Biological Sciences. And with that, we depend on a lot of members of the community to help us advance our research. And so we have recently launched this new uh, group, which I think is very exciting, called the BioSci Ambassadors, which gives a, a, you a chance and empowers you to help make a difference as it relates to mind, body, world. And it's a great way for you to engage connect and invest uh, with us. So I hope you will give some consideration to that. There should be some lev uh, some information in your brochure. And also, please see Rob and Martinelli at the end if you're interested. So on to the uh, matter at hand. There's uh, perhaps uh, nothing more critical in our society today than ad addiction. We know that it is truly a national epidemic. Many people are addicted to opioids, and it's a uh, area of critical um, discovery for researchers in the School of Biological Sciences. And among those leading the charge is our uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Marcella Wood, who is the chair of Neurobiology and Behavior. Uh, Marcello has been at Irvine since about 2004. He came here as an assistant professor, having previously trained at Princeton uh, University. And uh, there's no other way to describe him other than to say he is truly a rising star, uh, not only in the School of Biological Sciences, but in the addiction uh, field uh, as well. Uh, besides being just a tremendous scholar, he's an excellent teacher. His students just a, a, adore him, and uh, his colleagues likewise feel the same about him. It's impossible to have a conversation with Marcelo and not feel better about yourself uh, afterwards. And so uh, with that, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Marcelo uh, Wood. Well, th I'd like to begin by thanking Frank and the Dean's office. Um, I'll have to convince my kids that I didn't pay you to say those nice things about me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here today and uh, have the opportunity to share with you some of the research that's going on in our laboratory. And, and one of the, 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 the first things that comes to mind when I come to this auditorium is uh, back when I was an assistant professor, I was teaching uh, Intro to Cell Bio, this course called Bio 93, and it's a freshman um, cell biology course. And the first time I had to teach was in this very auditorium and about 400 students, and I had to teach uh, about photosynthesis, which I really don't know anything about. And when I was, a, 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 when I was a, an undergrad, um, my, my memory of my own cell bio course was showing up for the first day, showing up for the last day to take the final, and that was about it. I was a chemical engineer, so bio wasn't really hitting for me. Um, and here I was having to teach cell biology and uh, photosynthesis, and I was terrified. Um, I still remember the other two faculty that I te taught that course with at the time, Dr. Basiglio and Dr. Kramer were sitting up in the, in the far left over there. And, and that memory is just burned into my head. <laughs> um, since then, I've taught, uh, given a lot of uh, lectures on, on cell biology, and things have calmed down for me. But those memories are, are in my brain, and I will have some of those memories for the lifetime uh, that, you know, that I exist on this planet. 
And, and those memories are a product and one of the functions of our brain. And our brain has about um, 86 billion neurons. And so I'm going to try and switch microphones here. I don't like sitting behind a podium. And so uh, we have about 86 billion uh, nerve cells called neurons in our brain. And each one of those neurons makes about one to 10,000 different connections with other neurons in our brain. And so these neurons come into contact with each other and they start forming circuits and those circuits interact with each other. Different brain regions are working together. And from that we get emergent properties. And an emergent property in cell biology or any kind of biology is a fundamental principle. And so when uh, components come together, they form a function that is greater than one of those components. And so similarly, our brain, those neurons and the communication between those neurons come together and give rise to emergent properties like memory and reward, which I'll talk about today. And so just to give you an idea of the complexity of, of the uh, brain, this is a, a slice, uh, a coronal slice from a mouse brain and stained with a Golgi stain to look at some of the neurons. And so you can see an individual neuron here, all the branching, it's receiving a lot of input, it's uh, transmitting a lot of information to its neighboring uh, cells. And here we only see a very sparse number of, of neurons in the hippocampus, which is shown right here, this nice organized structure that's involved in memory. Uh, and this is a Golgi stain uh, after Camilo Golgi, who uh, invented the process back in 1873. And so this kind of approach has been around for over 100 years and used beautifully by a former graduate student, Annie Vogelsernia. Now uh, we're able to do things like this, where a brain can be optically cleared and the neurons can be stained and then um, uh, you use computer algorithms to uh, be able to look at the individual neurons, where they are in a three-dimensional space, travel down into that area, follow these neurons, and then the tracks and connections and projections that they form, and be able to understand how genes are expressed, where they expressed, when, and, and uh, all along this three-dimensional view. And so this is a new approach in neuroscience that's, that's gaining momentum. This was done by Dr. Sunil Gandhi in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior and his student, Ricardo. And incidentally, uh, Dr. Gandhi is now teaching a course for uh, bio students where the students get to clear brains and stain for different genes and, and look at where they're expressed in the brain and reconstruct that. And it's a beautiful approach. So back to neurons, these are the fundamental unit of our brain. And these, they're forming these different connections with each other to transmit information. And they're coming together to form circuits in, in the brain. And so we have memory circuits. Uh, and so here I, I showed you a picture of the hippocampus. And this is a brain region that we use to encode information, spatial, contextual information, episodic memories. Information that we're going to be uh, storing comes in through the hippocampus. And there are other brain regions in, in, in the memory circuit. We also have the reward circuitry, and so this is the, uh, the mesolimbic pathway, and you can see that the reward circuitry interacts then with the prefrontal cortex that we use for decision making. And the reward circuitry is there and has evolved to help us survive and to uh, procreate as a species. So survival of the individual and survival of the species. And so when we do things that are good for our survival, like eat food, the reward circuitry in our brain reinforces that behavior, reinforces that outcome so that we do it again. Uh, same thing with procreation, it keeps the uh, species uh, going. And, and the reward circuitry then interacts with the prefrontal cortex uh, so that we make the right decisions about those behaviors that have been reinforced. And so keep that in mind as we go through the talk because it becomes important in understanding aspects of addiction. And so how does, how does the reward circuitry do this? How does it, it reinforce behavior? And so again, we have to come back to the neuron. And here we're looking, we're gonna zoom in to how neurons talk to each other. And so this is, happens at a little area called the synapse. So we zoom in on that area here and we see that one neuron is making almost uh, physical contact with another but when something happens that the reward circuitry cares about, these neurons start to release neurotransmitter called dopamine. And so this one cell is releasing dopamine onto the other. 
And that's a signal that uh, reinforces uh, an outcome. So it's this neurotransmitter is adding value to a particular behavior that is good for survival or procreation. And so if we look at natural rewards, like food here, this is uh, just a, a, a graph showing the release of dopamine in one of the reward regions of the brain. We see that there's really nice uh, dopamine release when the animal's eating. Sex, you can see here, there's a much larger release of dopamine, much more pleasurable, and the brain releases more dopamine and for longer periods of time. But then what happens with drugs of abuse? So drugs of abuse tend to hijack the brain and use the same reward circuitry, but in a, in a different way. So why is that? And so drugs like cocaine, so here in the normal condition, dopamine after its release, after a while it gets taken back up. Cocaine blocks these transporters that uh, reabsorb cocaine. And so when cocaine is present, or dopamine, so when cocaine is present, it blocks the reuptake, and so there's much more dopamine flooding the synapse. And so there's much more communication. And uh, in the popular media, dopamine has been called the pleasure chemical. It's a bit of a misnomer, but it, it, it serves purpose here. And so you have a lot more of this, this neurotransmitter uh, flooding the synapse, and cocaine is, is helping uh, ha make that happen. And so if you look at uh, here, here's uh, dopamine release after cocaine, and so here, you know, food is about 50% uh, higher than baseline, sex you're getting at about 200, cocaine you're getting close to 350% of baseline, lasting longer, amphetamine here you're uh, over 1000% of over baseline, and morphine uh, one of the opioids that we've heard about it gets a nice increase, but the duration is much longer. And then one of the things that you've probably heard in the news a lot about is fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, which is about 50 to 100 times more potent uh, than morphine. And so you can imagine what that does to your brain and the sheer amount of dopamine that's being released and making your brain think that this is a behavior and this is something that should be reinforced and is of extremely high value to your brain. And so drugs of abuse, they affect the level of dopamine release and the duration of dopamine release. And so that's how these drugs of abuse hijack your brain into uh, doing things. And so if dopamine is so good, if it's necessary for our survival, if it's necessary for procreation, then why is more so bad? And so on our pathway to, to addiction, so drug, drug use activates the reward system. We just saw that. Um, cocaine causes release of dopamine, changes the, the amount and duration of, of dopamine release. And, and eventually, after chronic use, the brain starts to develop tolerance. And so the, the brain can only handle releasing so much dopamine and having so much dopamine around for uh, uh, such a, a sufficient amount of time and then eventually the brain starts to react to that and so it starts to withdraw connections it starts to change the connections in the reward circuitry so now this uh, uh, what's called tolerance is developed and an individual would need to take more drug in order to achieve the same level of pleasure and relaxation uh, etc depending on the drug um, than is necessary in the beginning and so but because the brain is responding in this way and, and reducing what the reward circuitry normally does, then things like food cease to be reinforced. They, it ceases to be pleasurable. Sex ceases to be pleasurable. And, um, and then uh, someone will then start to try and compensate by taking even more drug to now just to feel normal, not to get high anymore, but they're trying to bring the brain back to homeostasis. And so there, it comes uh, into this uh, symptoms of withdrawal when there's the absence of, of drug. And so following tolerance, this change in the brain, now if the drug isn't on board, the individual feels pretty bad. And so the symptoms of withdrawal include depression, um, low energy, uh, all natural rewards are, are no longer rewarding and they don't feel good. Um, and, and so it, 
it, it's, a, it's an awful state to be in. And, and so somebody suffering from addiction will take a drug just to get the brain back to normal. Uh, and, and, and that will take more and more drug just to feel normal. And eventually, because the reward circuitry is then engaged and intertied with the prefrontal cortex, which is making decisions, then the, because they're trying to get the reward circuitry back into a, some sort of normal state, the, the uh, prefrontal cortex starts to make really bad decisions. And so here the disease becomes a chronic compulsive drug-seeking uh, disease. Um, even in the presence of very harmful consequences, right? These harmful consequences are the, the um, product of making bad decisions. And so rather than going to uh, daycare and picking up uh, a child, someone is um, stopping off at a bar and forgetting about the child, right? And so the, this is where uh, it becomes a, an extremely dangerous chronic disease. And so to kind of understand how bad is this, um, in this country alone, every year uh, we spend about $740 billion uh, addressing issues related to drugs of abuse. It's an extraordinary amount of money. The amount of money that the National Institute of, uh, on Drug Abuse receives uh, just $1 billion to try and develop uh, treatments outreach and education, and fund scientific research to develop new treatments and understand the disease. Um, and, and so here, this is probably something you, you, you've seen also. So drugs involved in US overdose deaths. And so everything's on the rise. So here you see cocaine. Most people ask, why do we still work on cocaine? Cocaine has been overshadowed by opioids, opiates. But Cocaine is still one of the top drugs used in, in minority populations, and 40% uh, of these cocaine deaths are now, um, uh, uh, it's a dual use problem uh, where cocaine is being used in combination with fentanyl. These are fentanyl, basically fentanyl deaths up here, um, a synthetic opioid. And so fentanyl was developed as a pain medication, um, and it, again, it's the, the level of dopamine release can be 50 to 100 times higher than morphine. And so as a pain medication, it's extremely effective, but it's also extraordinarily addictive. And now, now that uh, uh, folks have learned how to synthesize it, you know, it's not very difficult to synthesize these things in, in uh, off-market labs. And so it, it's been flooding uh, the kind of the black market, if you will. And so all these deaths account to about 75,000 deaths uh, last year alone. And so, and this continues to increase. And this is why the opioid uh, uh, problem is called an epidemic uh, in this country and in other countries around the world. So now, this, in just this year, um, in 2018, um, overdose is now the leading cause of unintentional fatal injury. Um, in, in the US. And so it's a, a clear, absolutely amazingly devastating problem, and we still understand very little about it. And even the education that is being provided is very little. Um, and, and I'll explain a little bit about that towards the end of the talk. And so a after uh, a, a, a full compulsive uh, uh, drug-seeking um, chronic disorder has been achieved here, um, then there's a cycle of abstinence and relapse. Abstinence being periods where um, the drug is being avoided, there's no use of the drug, um, and that's very difficult to maintain. It's a chronic disease, and thus, uh, by definition, it is not something that just goes away after time. It is not something that is easily treatable, um, and that leads to relapse, uh, and then so relapse being a period of, of drug use. And so there's this constant cycle of abstinence and relapse, and hopefully people can uh, ultimately break that cycle or spend longer, times, uh, longer periods of time in abstinence. And so there are treatment programs trying to figure out how do we do that. And so for all drugs uh, across the board, the relapse rate is 40 to 60%, which again, <laughs> extremely high, but it also shows you that it's a chronic disorder. And these relapse rates are similar to other uh, chronic disorders uh, in the body and in the brain as well. Just to 
uh, give you an idea of how devastating this is and how difficult it is. This is a, a, a quote from Jamie Lee Curtis, who sometimes you can see here in the, uh, in the, um, in the, uh, the market over in, uh, ah, I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, sometimes you can see her around here. And, <laughs> and, and this, this quote that I read by her uh, just yesterday or the day before, I don't remember, um, just blew me away. Getting sober, so she became addicted to opioids and pain medications, um, uh, starting probably 10 to 15, 20 years ago. And so she wrote that getting sober remains my single greatest accomplishment, bigger than my husband, bigger than both of my children, and bigger than any work, success, failure, anything. I, that's an incredibly powerful statement to make and gives you an idea of exactly how devastating this chronic disorder really is and how difficult it is to maintain abstinence. Um, that quote basically says it all. So what are the things that then, if, if you do enter a period of abstinence, why isn't that good enough? Why do we have relapse and what triggers relapse? And so some of the three, the three main triggers are the drug itself. So re-exposure to the drug, whether it's cocaine, alcohol, um, et cetera, can trigger relapse. Stress is a powerful uh, um, uh, component that can really affect all sorts of physiological responses and brain function. And uh, pairings. And so these are uh, drug-associated cues uh, places, contexts, uh, where the drug has been taken, uh, like the bar, uh, things, paraphernalia, needles, a rolled up dollar bill. Um, uh, there's there's a, a quote by a cocaine addict who says every time he, he goes skiing and sees the snow-capped mountains, it just reminds him of cocaine. Um, it's just all of those cues are constantly triggering the brain because all of these cues are drug-associated memories. And these are memories that are encoded in an extremely powerful and persistent way. And so how then do these, these things trigger, trigger relapse? What is it that the drugs of abuse do to the neurons? And so again, we come back to the neurons. And so drugs change the neuronal structure and function of these neurons. And so how does a neuron change its structure and function? And, and in order to do that, it has to change the genes that are expressed inside this neuron. And so because the drugs change the structure and function of these neurons in, in a very persistent way, that's why relapse can occur after years or decades of abstinence. Somebody can be abstinent for 30, 40 years and still relapse. And that means that the, the neurons in the reward circuitry and in the memory circuitry have been altered for that period of time. So what can change the function and structure of a neuron for that amount of time? And in order to answer that question, we have to dive deeper into the, the neuron. And so I'm going to kind of take you a, into a, a, a little journey into the heart of a, of a neuron here, which is called the nucleus, and, and understand how genes are changed in a persistent way or giving rise to persistent changes in a neuron uh, in, inside this nucleus. So where are genes found? They're encoded on our DNA. There's Bio93, I don't know if there are Bio93 students here, but this will be familiar. So where are genes found? They're encoded on our DNA. That's the double helix. That should appear familiar to all of us. And if you took all the DNA inside of a single neuron, you'd have about six feet of DNA. And so it's hard to think, how do you get six feet of DNA into this microscopic nucleus? That level of compaction is about 10,000 fold. And even thinking about 10,000 fold is a number that our brains really can't come to gra grapple with. Um, and so it, it, this is what your, your neurons are doing. This is what every cell in your body is doing, not just your brain. Um, what we end up talking about fundamentally about gene regulation is going on in your brain and is very relevant to what we're talking about here, but it's going on everywhere too. So the DNA, in order to fit inside this little tiny nucleus, has to be compacted. And so the DNA gets wrapped around these proteins, and this structure is called chromatin. And then the chromatin can get further condensed. It gets further condensed, really super condensed. Also, it can get uh, put inside this tiny little nucleus. And so this is an electron micrograph of the real thing. 
And so you can imagine if you're a neuron and you're trying to change gene expression so you can change your, your structure and function, accessing the genes that you need in this mess is, is really difficult. And so how does, a, how does a, a neuron do that? Well, it changes access by changing the chromatin structure. And so this little symbol here, this is uh, one of these uh, red balls here. Um, I don't know why I changed the color to green, but uh, so be it. Uh, and this is a, a, a nucleosome. This is the repeating unit of chromatin structure. And so DNA, shown in purple here, is wrapped around it, and it's in this really tight structure. And so when it's really tight, there's no gene expression. The genes are off. But this structure can be opened up. And so here we have open chromatin. And now you have access to the DNA. And now the genes can be turned on. And so I'll use these symbols repeatedly throughout the talk. This one to refer to genes being turned off. This one referring to genes being turned on. And so changing chromatin structure, that compaction, here, and, and to turn genes on or off is considered an epigenetic mechanism. And so this is a term that is now entering the popular media. It's becoming more and more interesting the more we learn about it and the power of epigenetics. And so I'll, I'll take you through this a little bit. And so, but really epigenetics refers to above or beyond your genes because Normally, we think of the genes that are encoded on our DNA as being regulated by the sequences of the DNA. But now we're understanding that these genes can all be regulated by the structure of this chromatin. And so it's a regulation of genes that's above the DNA itself. And so a simple modern definition for neuroscientists in particular is that the regulation of genes, turning them on or off, by changes in chromatin structure is epigenetics. And so for the hardcore scientists in the audience, I'm just going to say, full disclosure, it's a lot more complicated. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, this definition is good enough. Um, epigenetics gets really, really interesting when we start talking about transgenerational inheritance of things that happens not by inheriting DNA, but by inheriting chromatin structure and epigenetic modifications. And that's a whole different world, but it's fun. And if you want to chit chat about it afterwards, I'm happy to. Okay, so epigenetics in action. So epigenetics is this weird word. It doesn't really hit home what it is. So we'll see some examples of how powerful epigenetics really is. And so here, our, our, we have our DNA wrapped around the, uh, this chromatin structure. And there are all these chemical tags. These are chemical modifications on the proteins and on the DNA. And so these are called epigenetic tags. And the collection of all these epigenetic tags is called your epigenome. Okay. And so these epigenetic, tag, these epigenetic tags change with experience, they change with environmental interaction, they change with different pesticides that we're exposed to, they change with our diet. And to give you an idea of how individual this can become, if we take monozygotic or genetically identical twins and look at their chromosomes, um, the, the, the epigenetic tags are almost they're, they're so similar, you can't tell them apart. But by the time these genetically identical twins are in their 50s, their epigenome begins to be as different as you and me, all because of what they've experienced in life, the things that they've eaten, etc. And that's why one genetically identical twin might develop a mental health disorder, addiction, cancer, and the other one won't. That's always been perplexing because they're genetically identical. This is one of my, uh, a, a more fun example that I like. Um, epigenetics determines who becomes a queen. So these two bees are genetically identical. Yet one is a worker bee, the other one's a queen bee. In the worker bee, the chromatin structure is repressed and the queen genes are turned off. So that's why this bee is a worker bee. This queen bee, when, when it was raised as a larva, it was raised inside this queen cup that's filled with royal jelly. And the royal jelly has, um, and we'll get into the, the details, but it has things that allow the chromatin structure to be open so that the queen genes can be turned on. Right? So this royal jelly is pretty special. <laughs> and so that's an example of the diet controlling the overall phenotype through epigenetic mechanisms, even though those bees are genetically identical. So that kind of illustrates the power. And so in, in 
in my lab. This is a slightly outdated picture. Um, I just realized I didn't have a new one when I was putting this, talking, this talk together. Um, but we're, we're interested in the questions, do epigenetic mechanisms regulate memory? And can we apply what we learn from memory studies to addiction? Okay. And um, it, it's nice that Frank invited me here to be part of the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. It's really cool, it's very prestigious, it's a deep honor. But my graduate student, Rianne Campbell, she got invited by Bill Nye, the science guy, <laughs> to be on his show, Bill Nye Saves the World, on Netflix, not Crystal Cove Auditorium. <laughs> she's just teasing Frank. <laughs> um, I think she's in the audience in case you want her autograph. So. <laughs> so coming back to memory, if we experience something uh, and, and we encode it into our, our brain for short term, it can last minutes to hours. In order for that information to consolidate and enter our long term memory that lasts hours, days, or lifetime, that requires gene expression. And, and so here, if we have an open chromatin structure, the genes are on, we get long-term memory. And then there's an enzyme called histone deacetylase 3, or HDAC3. And, and this is the only kind of jargon I'll throw at you, but um, HDAC3 is, is a massively important enzyme. It's expressed in every neuron in our brain. It's extremely potent enzyme. Um, and it's going to change this structure back into the repressed uh, form of, of chromatin. And that will turn genes off and prevent memory formation. Okay. And so what we wanted to know was if we delete HDAC3, can we open chromatin structure, um, facilitate gene expression, and change memory formation? Okay. So that, that was the, the question. And so how do we do that? What's the approach? In the lab, we use genetically modified mice. They're a model organism in which you can change uh, a single gene, or in this case, this enzyme, in a single part of the brain, in a single kind of cell in the brain, a neuron in this case, um, and be able to study the effect on behavior as it relates to memory. So it's one of the only model organisms that we can do this with. And so we do that by um, delivering a virus into the hippocampus of the animal, and that allows us to then manipulate the HDAC3 gene. And so this is a control uh, mouse uh, that received the virus. The enzyme is still expressed. That's the white that you see here. The neurons are still all happy and present, and the enzyme is shown there in those neurons. In the genetically modified mouse, when we deliver the virus, the virus uh, deletes the, the enzyme. So the HDAC3 enzyme is completely gone, so there's none there, even though the neurons are still there and quite happy. Okay. So all we've done using this approach is delete the enzyme in just the hippocampus of, of the brain. So how do you study memory then? And here we take animals and we put them into what's called an object location task. So the animal gets to explore two objects. They learn about the objects. 24 hours later, we give them a test where we move one of the objects to a new location, and the hippocampus really cares about that. And so if the animal has a long-term memory for this location, it'll spend all its time exploring the object in the new location. And so after 24 hours, we ask, do you remember? And so studying this in a mouse is extremely difficult because you can ask a mouse anything you want, and this is what you get, <laughs> right? And so, in order to understand and study memory, we have to observe performance and infer memory. And when I was in graduate school and I told my graduate advisor I was leaving cancer epigenetics for neuroscience to study learning and memory, he said, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. Why are you going to go work on something that you can't study directly? And it, it, he was very disappointed in what I was doing with my, my career. Um, but it's worked out okay. And so, <laughs> The, so we have this deletion of the HDAC3 enzyme, and we place the animal into a, the chamber with two identical objects only for three minutes. And this is sub-threshold. The animal cannot form a long-term memory by studying those objects for just three minutes. A day later, we give them the test. We move an object to a new location. And so in the control animals, the, this discrimination index is basically memory, 
Uh, so there's no solid memory uh, present. This is subthreshold. The animal's really not learning about it and being able to demonstrate that it remembers that. But an animal with the HDAC3 deletion has awesome long-term memory. And so what that means is that after a week subthreshold learning experience, there's no memory normally. But with an HDAC3 deletion, opening chromatin now this sub-threshold learning experience is transformed into long-term memory. And so that's pretty amazing if you think about it. This epigenetic mechanism is basically a barrier uh, in our neurons to forming memory. And if we open up that barrier, we can encode all sorts of things. Imagine, you know, again, Bio93 students, imagine studying for your exam for five minutes and remembering everything. Right? <laughs> There's a reason your brain doesn't do that. So, then we want to know about the memory persistence. How long does it last? Because epigenetic mechanisms should be able to change how neurons function in a very persistent way. So can you observe that with memory? So the animals are trained for 10 minutes, and then seven days later, they're tested. And if you train an animal for 10 minutes, they can show you lo good long-term memory uh, a day or two days later. So we look at seven days later, the control animals, no memory. The HDAC3 deletion animals have phenomenal memory. Okay, so that means with a strong learning experience, there's long-term memory, but after a while, there's memory failure, and we experience that all the time. We forget things, we can't recall things or retrieve them. In, in this case, with the HDAC3 deletion, we have long-term memory, but there's a persistent form of long-term memory. Okay, and so the, the HDAC3 uh, deletion generates a form of long-term memory that persists beyond the point at which normal memory fails. And so I'll ask you to remember that uh, for the next few slides. Okay, so opening chromatin structure dramatically changes learning and memory, transforms a subthreshold learning event into long-term memory, and generates a persistent form of memory. So knowing that, what do you think drugs of abuse do? Right? So uh, our lab and other labs have shown that cocaine uh, opens chromatin structure. It dramatically changes gene expression in neurons. And so what about drug seeking? And so to study drug seeking, this is a, a context cocaine associated memory formation. And so we study it in this apparatus. The animal is allowed to explore the apparatus. And initially, there's no preference. The animal likes all, all sides of this apparatus. Then the mouse it, receives cocaine in this paired side. So it starts to learn that, oh, this context is where I receive cocaine. And then Afterward, that, that conditioning, you give the animal a preference test. Where would you like to be? And the, there's huge preference for the paired side, right? And so this is uh, demonstrating that cocaine can lead to powerful memory for context. The brain has very quickly formed an association, a memory for the association between context and cocaine. And so, but what we wanted to know was, can that memory be extinguished? And so, what does that mean? And so we take the animal that has been uh, formed a context cocaine memory. There's the huge preference. And extinction now is a form of memory. It requires gene expression. And now the brain is starting to learn that that context is no longer associated with cocaine. And so that original memory starts to be extinguished. And so there's no cocaine. You show the animal the, the, the apparatus over and over, every day, over and over and over. And eventually, the animal loses its preference. And so this is called an extinction learning curve. And, and the animal has formed an extinction memory that that context is no longer associated with cocaine. And so that can take two weeks. Sometimes animals just won't extinguish. Um, but in most cases, yes, you can extinguish that, uh, give it enough uh, training. Oh, but then there, there are triggers, right? And so if the animal receives saline, this is just a salt solution. So after being extinguished, the animal receives saline. There's no change in preference. Didn't mean anything. But if you take an animal that's fully extinguished, give the animal cocaine, the preference immediately comes all the way back up. Extremely powerful, very rapid, and that's relapse in a mouse model of addiction. So the re-exposure to cocaine causes relapse. And so the million dollar question that we had was, we knew that cocaine can hijack the reward system, 
And we found out from the memory studies that HDAC3 deletion can enhance memory and change the circuitry here. And we knew that the learning and memory circuitry is integrated with the reward circuitry. These things don't exist in isolation in the brain. They're all connected. And so can deletion of HDAC3 enhance extinction of cocaine memory and prevent relapse? Can we use the learning and memory circuitry and, and use the epigenetic mechanisms there to override what the drug of abuse, cocaine, has done to hijack the reward circuitry? And so, again, we, put the, uh, we take the animals here, um, and, and, and we ask, does HDAC3 inhibition enhance extinction? And so we have three groups. One group one group's receives a saline control. This is just the solution that we put the inhibitor into. And here we're using an HDAC3 inhibitor. And so we can't go ultimately into humans trying to translate this and, and delete the HDAC3 gene inside the human brain. But we can use inhibitors, small pharmacological inhibitors, that pass the blood-brain barrier. And so this is one such inhibitor. Um, and the, this HDAC3 inhibitor, we, there's a group receiving a low dose, another group receiving a, a higher dose. And so initially, the groups have no preference. They have no preference. And then all three groups are conditioned to the paired side with cocaine, so they end up with a huge preference. But this test here is done in the absence of cocaine. And so that becomes the first extinction training session. So here the animals, even though they have a huge preference for this side, in this test, they didn't receive cocaine. So it's the first time that the brain is realizing, oh, this context isn't always associated with cocaine. That's a sub-threshold learning experience. And then the animals that receive, and so animals that receive the saline control, they don't extinguish. The animals that receive the medium dose begin to extinguish after a few days. But look at the animals receiving the medium dose, they extinguish the second day. So the sub-threshold extinction was immediately encoded. It was an amazing change in extinction memory. And so HDAC3 inhibition transforms sub-threshold extinction learning into rapidly encoded extinction memory. But that's not really the end game. Really what we want to know is, does the new extinction memory persist? Is that extinction memory so powerful that even in, in the presence of cocaine again, can that extinction memory prevent relapse? And so we use cocaine-triggered relapse again. Here's the apparatus. And all, all animals have been extinguished. They have no preference. And then all animals get a low dose of cocaine, which causes the relapse behavior. So here the control animals, they receive cocaine. They, their preference goes way up for the paired side. The low dose of the inhibitor didn't do a whole lot. The medium dose completely blocked relapse. And so this HDAC3 inhibitor can generate a persistent form of extinction memory that prevents relapse. And so this result has been replicated by other labs for cocaine. It's been replicated with morphine. It's been replicated uh, using more compulsive uh, 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 tasks to study addiction in, in animals. Um, and so it, it, it's kind of a proof of principle that there's a completely different mechanism and a different way of thinking about how we can approach an understanding of addiction as well as uh, potential treatments of addiction. And it all comes back to the, the neurons, right? And so these epigenetic mechanisms, they're, they're a master regulator of gene expression that changes neuronal structure and function. And we know that these mechanisms are amazing modulators of learning and memory. They can completely prevent you from encoding memory, and they can dramatically change what you encode into memory. Similarly, in the reward circuitry, drugs of abuse are taking advantage of, of these mechanisms and leading to really persistent changes in neuronal structure and function that are kind of the heart of what happens in addiction and why addiction is such a chronic disease. And even after abstinence, uh, the relapse triggers are very, very easy to trigger full on, on relapse. And no matter how long someone's been abstinent, because of the changes in these neurons that are maintained and driven by the changes in, in the epigenome. And so one last thing I wanted to say about addiction is that 
we still have a problem in this country and around the world of thinking of addiction as a problem of willpower or moral standards or ethical standards or what have you. People are lazy. Um, and this all was born from uh, it, it basically uh, uh, 100, 150 years ago when um, people suffering from addiction to different things, um, it was truly thought that they had a moral problem um, or that they lacked willpower, that they weren't strong enough, that they just made bad decisions. Um, and that, that perception completely invaded medicine um, and even academic understanding of, of this issue. And so there was never really much work done on it until the last kind of 30 years where things have slowly started to ramp up to now that we put a billion dollars into the research and understanding of addiction, which is still too, too little. And so one thing to keep in mind is that addiction is a real chronic brain disorder, just like any mental health disorder, like uh, major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Addiction is very, very similar and it should be thought of that way and we should be educating everybody in that, in that way. Um, the second thing is that we are in an unparalleled time to understand addiction and other mental health disorders. Uh, we now know about all sorts of other mechanisms that fall under the category of, of epigenetics. There are incredible other molecular mechanisms involved. And the more we understand about the basic research in those areas, the more opportunity we have to develop radically different treatments and therapeutics for this. And, and that's where the, the kind of the, the silver lining is. We are in a time, unparalleled time in neuroscience, where we can develop completely new things that we couldn't even have conceived even a, about a decade ago. And so with that, you know, as I was talking about how neurons interconnect to form these emergent properties like memory and reward, similarly, my, my lab and all our collaborators, um, all the interactions here at UCI uh, allow us to have this emergent property to be able to study things like um, taking an idea of studying epigenetics and cancer and applying it to understanding memory and addiction and those things being integrated all comes from conversations and discussions with colleagues uh, from the, the department, the school, other departments, awesome undergraduate researchers at UCI the organized research units, uh, the funding, and, and just being here in general allows for some pretty incredible work to be done. So thank you. I'll take any questions. Good job, Marcel. Thanks. So we can have the lights up. We'll have time for a few questions. Yes. Wonderful. I have a quick, quick question. Sure. Every college student I know tried alcohol, and the answer is some become addicted, some don't. Mm -hmm. So is there something in the genome that prevents the epigenetics from making one person versus another susceptible? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's probably one of the hottest questions in, in addiction neuroscience, as well as aging neuroscience. Um, what is it that makes someone I, either uh, vulnerable and susceptible or resistant? Um, and, and likely the, the, the answer will come in terms of a combination of both our genome, the things that we do inherit, there's absolutely a genetic component to addiction, um, but then there's also an epigenetic component to addiction. And the real interesting interface of those two for me are the single nucleotide polymorphisms in genes uh, that encode proteins and enzymes that work on the epigenome. And so, that's, I think, a very interesting area where kind of the, the epigenome is really the interface of nature and nurture. Um, that, that discussion isn't really valid anymore because that the interface really is the epigenome. And so uh, understanding the individual variability will probably be some, a mixture of, of that and in that domain. Someday we'll understand that, but you know, we, could, we could sequence the human genome. We were able to do that, we got a lot of answers but it didn't really answer a whole lot in terms of disease. And, and now there's a huge effort to understand the epigenome of the human. And yes, there are gonna be some components that are similar across all of us, but more than likely, most of it's gonna be different because we all have such different experiences. Over there, all right, side. So it's, 
It's and such a popular question that it was almost the question I was going to ask. Uh -huh. Almost. <laughs> but I have a spin on it, and it's more about process. So uh, the work that we always observe is being done with very specialized rodents. In other words, you have a very, you know, they've been, they've been built. They've been created. Is there any way in your research to almost reverse it? In other words, how do you come up with a lab animal that represents that exception of uh, relating it to human beings, mm -hmm. that person who does take drugs or is exposed to things doesn't get addicted. That person who has the drinks or has been in the hospital and they don't get addicted. How do you take that back to the lab and figure out how to test for that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So there, there are, um, so what I showed you here uh, is a particular inbred mouse strain that we all work with. And that allows our data to be generalized and, and kind of compared to all other labs across the country and, and around the world. But there are other strains uh, of mice uh, as well as outbred strains of rats that there are animals that are um, standard deviations outside the norm. And they do like consuming alcohol. They do like consuming cocaine more than the, the normal rodent that you'd have to condition to do that initially. And so that begins to model that component and, and trying to understand then kind of reverse back, okay, we have these animals that will do that, just like we have humans in the human population that will do that very quickly um, and, and go from recreational drug use to habitual and compulsive drug use very quickly. Um, but then you have to go backwards, like you said, go back to the genome, do the uh, genome sequencing, do the epigenome sequencing, trying to figure out what is it that drove that phenotype? And it's likely a combination of these things, a whole kind of orchestra of different modifications in different genes that all come together in the right brain region to drive that. Um, and and we, we still don't know enough. It's really the problem. We're in, we're in a, a time when we talk about big data, um, where we can get immense amounts of data, um, and yet it's still not enough. We, we still can't make heads or tails of some of these things. I think I'm going to get a little more granular still in the same direction. Right You're sorry. Ah, yeah. Um, on the one extreme, if you'd use the HDAC inhibitor mm -hmm. before you uh, give them the cocaine, mm -hmm. presumably you'd eradicate that whole behavior. But on the other end of the question, given that undoubtedly there must be HDAC genetic variants and mm -hmm. variants in expressions level and persistence of the message and all that across spectrum, what are other neurobehavioral consequences yeah. other than just yeah. the, path the pathological form of yeah. addiction? There must be behavioral yeah. consequences of this. Yeah, so, so to, to the first point, so if you give an animal, so in, in, in the genetically modified animals, we can form a, an HDAC3 deletion before the drug is taken. And so if you do it before, just like when you enhance memory for object location, if you do it before the association of the cocaine with the context, you actually enhance that. And so if these inhibitors are ever used uh, in, in, the, in, in rehab centers, and so we were very close to setting up, um, uh, being able to do this in a, in a rehab center in Houston that focuses on cocaine. Um, and there you're using the inhibitors in a very controlled setting and, and, and the, they call it habituation, but it, showing very salient cues and context for the individual over and over and over and over again, combining that with the pharmacological approach to extinguish those. And, and they had data suggesting that that would um, really reduce the rate of relapse um, and, and, and increase the, the duration of abstinence. Um, so it, it, these things have to be done ex in an extremely controlled manner um, because it, these inhibitors can dramatically change y your memory. And the reason we don't do this, right, and I don't know how many of you went to Jim McGaugh's talk, but memory is something that is used by our brain to encode things that are very salient and very important. And there's a reason we don't encode everything into memory. Um, there are savants who could encode information about this room where everybody's sitting, everybody's face, draw the whole thing a month later. But most of us would fail to even remember where one other person in this room sat a month from now. So your, your brain doesn't do that normally, but if you tweak these mechanisms, you, you probably could. And so in the normal human population, are there SNPs 
Are there mutations? Are there variants of these enzymes like HTAC3 that could give rise to different forms of memory? Um, we don't know in terms of uh, memory performance and enhancing memory. We do know with respect to intellectual disability disorders. So single missense uh, mutations uh, giving rise to a single amino acid switch in another enzyme uh, similar to this that regulates chromatin structure leads to um, <coughs> autism and other uh, mental uh, health disorders, uh, intellectual disability disorders, massive cognitive problems. And if it's happening early in development, you also have a lot of developmental abnormalities associated with it. The interesting thing is in those ID disorders and developmental abnormalities, um, we do know that the cognitive problems can be ameliorated in a mouse model of those when you combine the mutation in one gene with an HTAC3 deletion in another. And so we're constantly being contacted by families with children who have mutations in, in the other genes asking about the HTAC3 inhibitors for their children. But I'm not an MD and I tell them, you know, I, I can't really go there. I think Andy has a question in the back. Right I have a question about context of the board. You talked about the mice who went into that particular space. You got the cocaine that created some context, so they got returned to that space. What if you tweak the context? And I know that this might be a slippery slope, but let's say once they've been trained and they recognize that context, maybe now they go in there, they get the cocaine, but then they get a blast of an electric shock mm -hmm. or something as a result. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. No, that's a great question. And, and, and experimentally, people work on that. Um, my lab doesn't, but the, you know, one of the uh, components of compulsive drug seeking is compulsive drug seeking in the presence of harmful consequence. And so there are uh, models to study that exactly where the context is a harmful environment. There are shocks being delivered and yet the animal will still go there to receive cocaine. Mm -hmm. And so it, it depends on, on the, the, the rodent model being used, um, but similar thing happens with humans. Okay, we have a question in the front here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry if this yeah. is a simple question, but no, no, no. what's the end game here? Is it a drug development? Is it a... Um, yeah. yeah, so that's I a mean, great question. What's the end game? Yeah, so, so when, when we had first discovered this, um, we, we met with a, a huge group of um, uh, medicinal chemists, uh, industry CEOs, company folks, all the folks from NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, Nora Volkow, the director. In a huge meeting. It was slightly terrifying because I was, I was uh, an assistant professor at the time. And they wanted a pill to cure addiction. And, and before I could stop it, it came out of my mouth, and I said, you should be ashamed to think that we could cure addiction with a pill. And I let it fly before I could stop. <laughs> <laughs> and um, because the, in the cancer field, which I had just come out of, you know, the cancer field has been looking for a silver bullet for cancer for decades, decades and decades and decades, and it's not happening. And one of the reasons it doesn't happen is because of epi the epigenome. You know, we might have the exact same type of tumor, but the tumor will be different epigenetically, even though the genetic basis for the tumor might be identical. Mm -hmm. And so the treatments have to be different. They have to be individualized. And so similarly with addiction, there's no pill that's going to cure addiction. Right? But this approach does provide a completely different way of thinking about how we might. Because in a lot of cases, we think of uh, different disorders, oh, this is based in this brain region. But in it being here where I'm surrounded by people that work on addiction and memory and neurodegenerative diseases, we start thinking about how all the circuitry is interrelated. It's all working together. So now can we take a totally different approach, not only behaviorally, but with mechanistically? And so now maybe we can use these pharmacological approaches. These are FDA approved inhibitors. And so can we find the right context to, to do that? Well, so, so these, these inhibitors, like this one, will come in, it'll enter the brain, it'll be present in the brain for about half an hour to two hours. And so you can have a discrete time window, that's why it has to be done in a controlled setting, but you can have a discrete time window to extinguish cocaine-associated memories, for example, um, and then the drug is off board, the, the HTAC3 inhibitor 
is off board. So, so Nikon, I think, has a question. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Could you yeah. go down two directions? So one, remove the memory by doing like electric convulsive therapy, ECT therapy, mm -hmm. or on the other end of the spectrum, could you replace that pleasure with a different reward? Let's say a more controllable reward like buprenorphine or even marijuana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a good question, uh, and, and there um, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about uh, transcranial stimulation, and, and you know, people are using uh, TMS in order to uh, change how the prefrontal cortex uh, responds to drugs of abuse and, and drug seeking. Um, there, there are promising studies both in rodents and in humans. Uh, Anto Banchi's work out of Italy seems to suggest that that done in, in cocaine addicts and humans will reduce their relapse rates and, and drug seeking. Um, but I, I'm totally out of my, my territory there. So I don't really know. What about the age of the animals? When, mm -hmm. uh, do you start off with naive young and old animals? Is there a difference in terms of addiction? Yeah, so, so in, in, in the aged animal, we don't know a whole lot. Um, but in the adolescent, yeah, the adolescent brain is developing. Um, synaptic uh, uh, connections are being pruned and changed in the adolescent brain. And so drugs of abuse have a completely different impact on the adolescent brain that then is maintained and changed in, in the adult brain. And so there are folks here at UCI that study the effect of nicotine on adolescent brain and how that then changes how the brain responds to things like cocaine as an adult. It's quite different. And so the adolescent exposure is much more dangerous. All right, well with that, I'll say, uh, I hope you had a little bit of dopamine release today. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that I'm not Bill Nye. I hope this was still worthwhile to you. Uh, but thank you. Uh, let's thank Marcelo thank you so again. Much. Thank you. Thank you.